we've been talking about our great salvation and specifically now we've been talking about the blessings that we received through salvation there's a reason we uh, i'm talking about this now <clears throat> because when in times like this when everything seems to be changing and uh, everything is affected uh, the whole world has changed all that we can't adopt the attitude of the world and say everything has changed no some things haven't changed <clears throat> and one of that is your salvation yeah everything may have been affected and everything may have been you know shaken up a bit but your salvation has not been shaken up a bit have you thought about that <laughs> just the thought of that encourages me all that has taken place in the last one year and it has affected different people to different extent some have some more some less but no matter how much you are affected if you are a believer in christ your salvation has not been affected one bit that is an astounding thought to me and that is why i choose to speak on that and purposely i focus on spiritual blessings of salvation for several reasons one is they are foundational to everything else there are every kind of blessing is in salvation in christ it comes through salvation in christ but the thing is spiritual blessings are foundation but also again in a time when this and that has been you know kind of affected i think it's you have to first focus on what has not what cannot be touched the great american theologian <clears throat> preacher jonathan edwards <clears throat> who they say is the greatest theologian america ever produced and probably one of the finest thinkers ever in his first they think it's his first sermon as a young man he preached a sermon on why christians should be happy at all times no matter what no matter what is happening in their lives christians can be happy and he gives a few reasons the number one reason he gives is a christian can be happy no matter what because bad things in his life will be turned into good isn't that an astounding that's a ridiculous hope that we have as christians every bad thing god promises that he will ultimately turn it to good ultimately is the key word now it may seem bad and now you can't see how it can be turned into good but ultimately and by the way god has an eternity to prove it to you ultimately he will work it out for your good that is the first reason he gives the second reason he gives is first reason is bad things will turn in, be turned into good for the christian second reason he says is your good things can never be taken away <laughs> your good things can never be taken away it can never be touched by anything any power any force any disaster nothing and so i started to see what he's talking about you know what what are these good things he's talking about and he's talking only about the spiritual good things we get no wonder he can say a statement like that the spiritual blessings that the believer has cannot be touched it cannot be affected cannot be uh, you know it is rock solid you know what i mean you're forgiven you're cleansed the things we've been talking about you are justified you're made righteous in the sight of god you are born again no matter what happens in the world it cannot change any one of those truths so if your focus is all on the other good things see our when we say good things we immediately think the house the this the that you know we, we tend to think materially or you know the other stuff right and those are all good things as well every good and perfect gift comes from above but there is a priority the spiritual good things are so rock solid that they can never be touched there is something special about that and in times like this when you put your focus there you will get greater faith and confidence and hope and peace if you just put your focus on what is changing and what is being affected and you're just trying to change that just trying to improve that that is not the approach of the christian my friend <laughs> we start from the spiritual we start from the rock solid foundation and then we move 
And that's why we are focusing on spiritual blessings of salvation. And today also I want to put before you another spiritual blessing of salvation. Already we've seen how we're forgiven, how we're cleansed, how we're justified, how we are born again. And today we are sanctified. We, let me put it like this, we have been sanctified. We have been made holy. This is yet another spiritual blessing that we receive as part of our salvation in Christ. We have already been made holy. Now, you may, you may have never thought of holiness as a blessing. Right? Because when we, the moment that we say holy, people immediately think we have to live holy, we have to do holy things, or you know, we have to grow in holiness, we have to do this, are we living holy? <clears throat> the subject of holiness itself, people focus mainly on what you have to do, how you have to live holy, how you have to grow in holiness, are you living holy? The entire focus is there. But if you look at the Bible, <clears throat> the way that subject of our holiness starts is, for the believer, the Bible clearly teaches that you have already been made holy. You have already been made holy. You have already been sanctified. This is an important and repeated teaching in the Bible, but people ignore it. People are unaware of it many times. <clears throat> and so they're only harping on, are you living holy? You know, you need to be more holy. And all that is important. Yes, we do need to be more holy. We do need to grow in holiness. This is important. Holiness is about pleasing God. Holiness is not a bad word. <laughs> holiness, is not, holiness is not a, what can I say? Some people, when they hear holiness, you know, it's a, it's immediately a boring thing. Well, holiness is about pleasing God. And if you're a true believer, you are interested in pleasing God, right? And so the, the way to grow in pleasing God is foundationally, you've got to understand that God has already in some sense made you holy. <clears throat> and this is one of the blessings you receive in the salvation package in Christ. Today, we're not, I'm not going to focus on we need to live holy and how, to, how can we grow in holiness? No, that's not the focus today. The focus is, we've been made holy. Let's talk about that. This is a huge blessing. Only if we understand this, we will be able to better live holy. So this has an effect on your holy living. An effect. But this is not about your holy living. Today, the message is about how you've already been made holy. <clears throat> And once you understand this, it will help you to live. It will help you to grow in holiness. Now, let me just say a couple of things before I begin. One is a sermon like this. Only believers will be pleased with it. Only believers will find any kind of joy and uh, satisfaction in this. And you go to, If I go to unbelievers and talk about spiritual blessings of salvation, I don't know. right? But believers somehow have this desire that they want to please God. Right? And so believer will be, I think if you are receiving some kind of peace, joy, comfort, hope, strength from the sermons in the last few weeks, we're talking about spiritual blessings of salvation. If you are a person who says, you know, my heart is being filled with joy as I hear these truths, that itself is a proof, one of the proofs that you are a true believer. Because only a true believer can rejoice in these kind of truths. But I think this, uh, what we're talking about, this holiness matter, actually people don't realize, you know, people in the world sometimes think it is irrelevant, impractical. What are you talking about holiness? Still something practical to life. Well, it's very practical actually. Because holiness is God's answer to a very deep yearning inside of man. Inside of every man, whether believer or un unbeliever, there is a yearning to be the best version of myself. <laughs> there is a yearning. Believers are more, you know, they want to hear topics like this. But even unbelievers, they don't realize it. There is a deep yearning inside each man to be the best version of himself or herself. If you give a person everything they need, the money, the food, the house, the family, the work, the job, the status, you give him everything, but his character is bad, he's going to hate himself. 
He's never going to find fulfillment in life. Every time he looks at the mirror, he's going to hate himself. He just can't live with himself. He can't even tolerate himself. He can't even accept himself. There is a deep yearning within man to be the best version of myself, you know, to, to improve as I'm improving the general quality of my life. I want to improve my character. I want to grow in my character. I want to leave these character flaws behind. You know, I want to leave these bad habits behind and I want to grow. In my character, there is a yearning inside every man. And the Bible teaching on holiness answers that. It says, it is possible only if first God makes you holy. <laughs> only if God goes inside of you and does something major, major overhaul. Only then can you really change, really grow in your character, really develop. Right? Real change, deep change comes only when God produces the change first inside of you. Right? And that's what this Christian teaching is about. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about how God has gone deep inside of us and done such a major change that now real change, you can live in a different way, in a better way. You can grow in your character, grow in your holiness. I'm not saying you can become perfect in this life. One day we will be perfect Actually, he will make us perfectly holy, even in conduct, right? Even in nature, even in character, perfectly. That's the hope of the Christian one day. But even in this life, you can really be on the path of holiness, growing in it in your life. You can really be on the path of self-development. And so I think it applies to everybody, but let's begin. You've already been made holy, right? God has already made believers holy. Now let me first show you this teaching from the Bible and then we'll talk about how this happened and then what it means, right? This is the Bible's teaching. This is not something we are saying. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. The Bible's clear and repeated teaching. Paul is speaking about Corinthian believers, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. I'm taking you to this verse because Corinthian church, the Corinthian believers are the most unholy people. <laughs> The most unholy church in the New Testament is the Corinthian church. If you want to talk about holiness by way of conduct, by way of life, which is how Christians generally think about it, right? If you're talking about believers' holiness, they generally only think about conduct, life, behavior, all this. If you talk about, if you think in those terms and you come to the Corinthian church, they are the worst. Worst conduct, worst behavior, worst character, worst nature, whatever, Right? But Paul speaking to them, look how he addresses them to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Some translations will say to those who have been made holy. Some translations say to those sanctified. They mean the same, right? To those sanctified in Christ, Christ Jesus. Right? Later on, he's going to tell them that you need to leave your old ways. You need to leave these sinful practices. You need to change. He's going to blast them. You know, Paul really, sometimes he blasts the Corinthians, you know. <laughs> he gives them a good scolding at times. But the thing is, he addresses them as sanctified in Christ Jesus. Who am I writing to? Not these uh, worst uh, Corinthian believers. No, he says, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. They may be living unholy lives, but since they are, most of them are true believers, Paul says, they are sanctified in Christ Jesus. I want you to say that. Sanctified in Christ Jesus. Made holy in Christ Jesus. By yourself, you are not holy. If God looks at you and you look at yourself by yourself, there's no way you can say, I'm holy, perfectly holy. But, when God looks at you in Christ Jesus, you are sanctified. You are somehow holy, right? Because you're in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. I'm going step by step because some people may not know and understand these things. For those of you who know, please bear with me. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. Such were some of you, who, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. This was Corinth, a city which had a bad reputation. You know, uh, these people had come from uh, the, the, the kind of the worst of Roman culture. <laughs> and they had this kind of, you know, bad moral backgrounds. And Paul says, such were some of you. you. You guys came from this background. You came from that kind of a life. Actually, some of them have not left all of their old practices. They're still dabbling in some of that. And he's going to, after this verse, tell them, you better get your act together. 
but before telling them live holy he stops in the middle and he says you were such were some of you but something major has happened to you a major change has happened what has happened you were washed you were sanctified you were justified in the name of the lord jesus christ and by the spirit of our god what is he talking about he's talking about he's saying you were saved you were like this but now you have been saved by Christ Jesus that's what he means by saying in the name of the lord jesus christ right people put the, their trust in the name of the lord jesus christ and that's how they get saved right and by the spirit of our god when a person puts their trust in the name of the lord jesus christ in what the name stands for the person and all he has done when a person puts their faith in christ and what he has done the spirit the holy spirit washes them sanctifies them justifies them right what he's saying is corinthians you you used to be different but now you're saved and if you're saved something major has happened what has happened you know you were washed you were sanctified you were justified can we see those say those three words washed sanctified justified notice everything is in the past tense it's actually perfect tense in the greek i think but anyway it's past it's not it's finished right washed sanctified justified right washed sanctified justified and notice also that they are they are, they are separate terms sometimes people will make uh, holy and righteous as equal sanctified and justified they will take it as the same meaning no it's not that's why there are two separate words you were washed you were sanctified you were justified to be justified means to be accepted as righteous by god to get his approval he uh, he accepts you and approves you as he does his own son he congratulates you as though you accomplished and lived a great life when you never did based on christ's righteousness he accepts you that is justified sanctified is something else we'll talk about it i'll tell you what it means but for now just notice it's different peter calls the believers in 1 peter 2:9 as a royal priesthood you seen that verse 1 Peter 2:9 you should know these important verses he's addressing all believers and he says you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation and he goes on i want you to say those words a royal priesthood you may say what does that even mean it means kingly priests <laughs> right it means kings who are priests or priests who are kings <laughs> kings and priests basically that's what it means priests in the old testament were people who could go into the tabernacle whereas ordinary people couldn't they had that extra worthiness extra holiness to be in that extra holy place <laughs> right but in the new testament the new testament teaches that all believers are priests the priesthood of all believers there is a teaching called the priesthood basically it means all of us believers are priests even though you know there may be differences between a pastor and a and a believer there is no difference in terms of worthiness before god we all are justified in christ we all are sanctified in christ right we are a royal priest just say it like that royal priest right a holy nation is looking at the people and saying you're a royal priest and you're a holy nation and then two verses later he's going to tell them now start living holy start living these other things because you're a royal priest and you're, you're a holy nation so the foundation for holy living is what god has already made you he's made you a royal priest and a holy people or nation hebrews 10:10 another verse clear verse where this is teaching is very clear that we have been made holy already hebrews 10:10 10, 10. and by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all <clears throat> we have been sanctified it's the perfect tense in the greek which means it's done and its consequences continue on we have been sanctified it's over and the effects continue we have been sanctified if you want to get the full effect of it look at verse 14 verse 14 come down few verses hebrews 10:14 for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified interesting verse by a single offering jesus died only once on the cross single offering on the cross by that single offering he has means god has perfected for all time 
or perhaps Christ has. Right? He has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Notice that language there. He has perfected for all time. Saying believers are in some sense perfected for all time, forever. By one offering on the cross, Jesus for all time, forever perfected us already, finished. That's mind-blowing, right? We're not perfect. Yeah, I know we're not perfect. But the Bible says in some sense we have been perfected for all time. And look in the verse, it also says, but we are still being sanctified. Being sanctified, right? Grammar and the Bible, you thought grammar was only for school. You're wrong. Look at the tense. Being sanctified is present. Present continuous tense. There is a present continuous action that God is doing. He is slowly making us more and more holy. We are being sanctified. But at the same time, in one sense, we are already perfected for all time. The Bible teaches both. In one sense, we are already holy for all time. Perfected. Once for all. Finished. Done. Just as Jesus died once for all, we are perfected for all time. But the Bible also teaches that there is something called a progressive sanctification. Right? Slowly. But today we focus on this already been made holy, not the progressive part. Now, I just read these verses to so that you'll see that this is biblical teaching and based on these few verses, you should have noticed some things and let me point that out. You should have noticed that believers are in some real sense already made holy. Real sense. Everybody say real. This is not fiction. or This is not even saying, just think of yourself as holy. This is not just think of yourself like this and you'll be like this. No. It, you notice the verses we read, it doesn't say, think of yourself as sanctified. No, it says, you have been sanctified. This is really something that has happened to believers. We'll talk about what it means later. Secondly, you should have noticed that this is not something we have done. This is something God did. Did you notice every time I read that verse, everything is in the passive tense. We have been sanctified. We have been sanctified. We didn't sanctify ourselves. It was done to us. We did nothing. He did it. We have been sanctified. God did it. You should have noticed, thirdly, that this has, this is not about holy living. Yeah, it's connected. It leads to that. Yeah, you know, it's foundational for that. But it's not about holy living. If the Corinthians are sanctified already, made holy, then it can't be about holy living. <laughs> It's something about something else. We have to understand what it's about. And fourthly, you should have noticed that this has happened once for all and it's a done deal never to be repeated again. That last verse we read, perfected for all time. The sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice of Jesus on the cross has a once for all effect in changing us in this way, making us holy for all time. Already holy, finished, done deal never to be repeated and therefore never to be reversed either. You can't reverse this. Once it's done, it's done. Every true believer, I'm talking about true believers, every true believer who has true salvation, in the moment of their salvation, God has already made them holy in some way. You know, you, you may say, how, how did this happen? You know, how did this happen? Well, let's go to that question. How? Right? The Bible gives several answers for how this happened. The first answer is, through the finished work of Christ, through what Jesus did on the cross, not through what you did, living holy or something like that, through what Jesus did, not even through your great surrender, no, through what Jesus did on the cross. Hebrews 10.10, 10, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. We just read that. Right? Finished work of Christ. Hebrews 10.29 says, the blood of the covenant sanctified us. Hebrews 10, 29. I don't have time to read the verse, but the blood. So one verse says the body that was sacrificed on the cross. Another verse says the blood, Jesus' blood had the power, has the power to sanctify us, make us holy. Right? So that's one answer. The finished work of Christ. That's how we're sanctified already. Another answer, you know, we can't leave it there because just because Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood doesn't mean everybody's made holy. No, only believers receive this. Only the truly saved ones receive this. Only those who have real salvation, right? What happens in salvation? 
you, the most fundamental thing that happens in salvation is we are united with Christ. Right? Everybody say, united with Christ. I'm making you say it so that you'll remember it, right? United with Christ. The most fundamental thing that happens when a person gets saved is they are united with Christ. So that salvation is not just through Christ, but it is also in Christ. It's not just through what Christ did for us on the cross, right? Like a person who comes and does, you know, sacrifices much for us and then we get the benefit and then we say bye-bye and go away. No. It's through his work, but it's also in him, meaning it's only in connection with him. When a person gets saved, the fundamental thing that happens is, is they're connected with Christ. They're connected with the living Christ. <laughs> they're united with Christ. They're put in Christ. Christ is in them. They are in Christ. They're forever united with Christ. When you get saved, the greatest blessing you get is Christ. <laughs> In Christ, you get everything. In Christ, you uh, get forgiveness and cleansing and justification and sanctification and everything. So, how were you sanctified? You were sanctified in Christ. In Christ, you got this holiness. Look at 1 Corinthians 1.30. 1 Corinthians 1.30. I'm trying to say how we were sanctified. Of Him are ye in Christ Jesus who was made unto us. Look at the language. Of Him, of God... God has put us in Christ Jesus. That's what it means. When we got saved of him, are ye in Christ Jesus? And Jesus was made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Everything is in Christ. All the spiritual blessings are in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Jesus was made unto us righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Again, notice different words, right? Don't equate righteousness and holiness. There's a difference. Being made holy, being made righteous is different. So, how are we made holy? Through the finished work of Christ. How are we made holy? Through, we actually receive it through union with Christ, by being united with Christ. How are we made holy? Who does this union? And who actually on the ground does it? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. You know, God planned our salvation. The Son finished the work of salvation on the cross, the Holy Spirit applies the finished work to the hearts of the believer. The Holy Spirit, that's why it's called in 1 Peter 1 verse 2 as the sanctification of the Spirit. This is the sanctification of the Spirit. The Spirit goes in there where nobody else can go into your heart and sanctifies you when you put your faith in Christ. How does this happen? Another answer the Bible gives is it happens through the Word. Through the Word. Jesus said in John 15 verse 3, Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Clean because of the word. John 17, 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sanctify them by the truth, which is your word. So we are sanctified in salvation by truth or by word. And that means it's gospel truth. Gospel word. That's what it means. I don't have time to go and show, but that's what it fundamentally means. It all begins with the gospel word. When you hear the word of the gospel, the truth of the gospel about Jesus, and when you put your faith in Christ, that moment of salvation, what happens is something miraculous happens. You are just doing something very simple. You're just saying, you know, Jesus, I need you. Come into my heart. You know, I need you. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. You're just doing something very simple. But the Holy Spirit gets in there and he applies the finished work of Christ. You know how? By you. Uniting you with Christ. He unites you with Christ. And in Christ, you get everything. You get righteousness, sanctification, redemption. You name it. All the blessings in Christ. Right? So everything is involved. The word of the gospel, the Holy Spirit, the finished work, you know, union with Christ. All this is there. Right? Now, let me move on. So, I can go on, you know, trying to explain this. But really, it's a miracle. God has gone in there and done something and made you holy. <laughs> the moment of your salvation. Can you believe it? Can you accept it? Right? Can you say, yeah, you know, I think you need to accept it even before you understand it fully. <laughs> yeah, God has done it. I can't do it, but God has done it. Now, let me actually talk about what it means. What does it mean? Okay, we've been made holy. We've been sanctified. What does it mean? We use that word, holy, 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 sometimes without even thinking about what it 
means. We've been made holy by God. What does that mean? Well, I already told you, it does not mean something. Clearly, it does not mean living a holy life. We've been made holy does not mean we are living a holy life and therefore we've been made holy. No. It has nothing to do with that because, let me correct that, not nothing to do. But it's not about that. The Corinthians were not living holy and yet they were, Paul says, they were made holy. It does not, something else it does not mean is justified or made righteous. I already told you. Made holy is not the same as made righteous. Sanctified is not the same as justified. Separate words for separate truths. Connected, overlapping, but separate. Separate meaning. We got to see what it is. Another thing it does not mean, we've been made holy, does not just mean that we have been cleansed and purified. Because people, when we say you've been made holy, they may just think, oh, I've been cleansed. I've been purified. No. It's something more than that. Yes, cleansing is something, you may say, it's a part of sanctification. It's a prerequisite for sanctification. In other words, you've got to be first clean before you can be made holy. You know, in, in Tamil, for those of you who understand Tamil, it comes out very clearly. The word parisuttam, suttam is inside parisuttam. But parisuttam is still more than suttam. You know, in English, I can't show it to you like that. But what I'm saying is, you got dirty here, you got clean here. Holy is a higher step. You got holy over here. When we came to Jesus, we came dirty. We came as dirty sinners. So to make us holy, he has to cleanse us. So we spoke about two weeks back. But then cleansing, just cleansing is not making us holy. This is another higher step. Making us holy is something higher than that. A dirty thing can't be made holy. A dirty thing will be cleansed and then made holy. Right? You know, quickly, Leviticus 16, 19. You see that these are two separate things. God tells the high priest to sanctify the altar from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. Right? The altar and look at Leviticus 16, 19. You will see that these are two separate things, cleansing and <clears throat> making holy. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and sanctify it. Cleanse it and sanctify it from the uncleannesses of the people of Israel. You know, uh, another reason I say that uh, cleansing is not equal to sanctification or making holy. Puri just purifying, cleansing it, making it clean, washing away the sin, that's not making holy. <clears throat> because if it was, then you can't understand many passages in the Bible which talk about things made holy. For example, Genesis 2-3. That meaning will never apply to many passages. Genesis 2-3. Look at this very strange passage. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. <clears throat> he made what holy? The seventh day. <clears throat> Does that mean he cleansed it? No. Look at John 17, 19. Jesus is speaking here. And for their sake, I make myself holy. Or I sanctify myself. Jesus is saying, for their sake, I sanctify myself. Is Jesus saying, you know, I'm cleansing myself from sin? Is Jesus saying, oh, I used to live a sinful life, but now I'm leaving all that and going to live a holy life? No, it has, the meaning is not cleansing. The meaning is not starting to live a holy life. No, making holy. Jesus never lived a sinful life. There was no sin in him. He knew no sin. What is he talking about? Why is the word used like this? It's because the basic meaning, the essential, central, main meaning of holiness is something else. What is it? Let me give you the meaning. It is to set apart for God. To make something holy is to set it apart for special use. Right? To set it apart for special use. If you take that meaning, you can understand all these passages. God made the Sabbath day holy means what? There are many days in the week, but he set apart this one day for special use for himself. Right? Jesus, when he says, I sanctify myself, he doesn't need cleansing. He's already living a holy life. What does he mean? He's saying, I set myself apart. For you, what he means is the cross. It's a prayer he prays just before the cross. Jesus is praying a prayer of, you know, dedicating himself. He's saying, I set myself apart for you to fulfill your purpose on the cross. Nothing will stop me. For you, I will go to the cross. That's what it means. I set myself apart, right? 
Now, what we are saying is, God has set you apart for Himself. God has set you apart for Himself. God has set you apart for His use, for His purposes to live for Him. Look at some examples here. Exodus 40, some examples. In the tabernacle, you can't just take anything and start using it for God in the Old Testament tabernacle. You want to take a vessel, right? If somebody comes and gives a vessel and says, keep it in the temple, you know, it'll be useful, yeah? You can't just start using it like that. No. Just like that, you can't. No, it has to be consecrated or set apart for service to God. It was a formal thing. It was taken very seriously, done very seriously. For example, Exodus 40 verse 9. <clears throat> you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle. He's telling the priest, you know, Moses and the priest, and all that is in it and consecrated and all its furniture. All the furniture, consecrate it. Anoint it and <laughs> consecrate all the furniture so that it may become holy. Right? You shall, verse 10, you shall anoint the altar of the burnt offering and all its utensils and consecrate the altar so that the altar may become most holy. Verse 11, you shall also anoint the basin and the stand and consecrate it. This was something very serious, very formal. You had to take this step before you can use it for God. Look at the next verse. Utensils used for God. But next verse is about a human being. Verse 12. Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of the meeting. You shall wash them with water. You see what's happening? Cleansing first. Symbolizes cleansing. Washing with water. And put on Aaron the holy garments. And you shall anoint him and consecrate him. Cleansing and then consecration. Setting apart for God. And then only he can serve as priest. Can't just say, I surrender, I give. No, no, no. This whole thing has to be done symbolizing God setting him apart to serve him. Right? And, and the key is, henceforth, what is set apart for God is only for God. <laughs> Once you set apart that vessel, that utensil, you can't then take that vessel and put some curry in it and eat from it. You can't take it back to your kitchen. No, I, you know, I, I broke my vessel. Now let me just take it and I'll borrow it and give it back to you. No, 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 you can't. Once it has been set apart for use, for God's use in the temple, you can never use it for anything else. It's done, finished. Only for God. Aaron, so far he was just one among the Israelites, but now he's set apart as a high priest unto God. And so were his sons. We have been set apart to serve God only. Listen to me. I'm not saying you, dedicate, you set apart yourself. I'm saying you have already been set apart to serve God. <laughs> who, who did this business setting apart? God did it. When the Bible says God made you holy, we have been sanctified. It means we have already been set apart to serve God. It's already done. I don't know if you realize what an amazing thing this is. Let me split that setting apart. Think about that setting apart picture, right? When you're setting apart something, you're separating something from the old connection and establishing the new connection. These vessels were there, part of other vessels, but they were removed from them, separated, and now they are placed in the tabernacle after, you know, dedication, right? Separation from the old, dedication to the new, right? It involves these two steps, Setting apart involves separation from the old and dedication to the new. In the Old Testament, everything that happens in the Old Testament is a picture of a greater reality. In the Old Testament, the picture of salvation is what? The major picture of salvation is God bringing the people of Israel out of Egypt. After he brings them out, he tells them in Leviticus 20 verse 26, I have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. I have separated you from the <laughs> peoples, <clears throat> from all the other nations. I've separated you that you should be mine. That's a picture of a greater reality. In the New Testament, Jesus says in John 15, 19, I chose you out of the world. I did what? Chose you out of the world. In another place, he says, you are not of the world. <laughs> He tells God in his high priestly prayer in John 17, they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Last week we said you're born again. One of the meanings for born again is born from above. 
born from above chosen out of the world there is a separation from the world there is a separation from your old connection right 1 peter 2:11 puts it like this i you know talking to believers it says believers are foreigners and exiles or one translation one 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 scholar says resident alien and visiting foreigner <laughs> 1 peter 2:11 right we read a verse earlier 1 peter 2:9 it says you're a royal priest and a holy nation two verses later he says i urge you as foreigners and exiles as temporary residents to abstain from the passions of the flesh what he's saying is don't you know who you are your identity you have been separated from the world you no longer belong to the world you are like a foreigner you know when we think when we say foreigner we immediately think he's a foreigner in this nation he belongs to another nation but what the bible says is you are a foreigner to the entire world you don't belong anywhere here you are on a temporary uh, visa think of it like that you are here on a work visa or a student visa this is not your home you are born from above your home is the new heavens and the new earth you are just here temporarily for a purpose for a while and then you're going back to your home see he's saying don't you know who you are you are a, you are a, you have been separated from the world you are no longer belonging to the world that attachment has been cut you are a foreigner you are a temporary resident right you don't belong here and therefore don't act like them don't act like the world because you don't belong to the world you are not of the world you're born from above your home is in a different place you are here on a temporary visa kind of thing what i'm saying is this separation there's a re- there's a real separation again it's something real something that has happened deep inside it's not something that happened outside it's it's something that's happened so much that it's affected your identity it has changed your identity it has made you a foreigner in this world separation and then dedication is the next step right dedication right we're talking about what it means to be made holy it means that god has separated us from the old connections from the from our connection to the world you know from all our connections to sin and the flesh and all these things he has separated us and then dedicated us right dedication what does that mean when we you know we have baby dedications we have house dedications christians understand that right very age old christian traditions you want to name a child have a dedication right some people do it kind of meaninglessly right anyway we have to name the child we have to have the dedication you want to go and live in a house well let's have a house dedication you know sometimes people are just wanting god to bless the child god to bless the house but the word dedication what does it mean we keep using the word dedication i don't know if we realize what it means what does dedication mean dedication means if a person is really dedicating their child meaningfully what it means is they are saying parents are saying let this child live henceforth not for me not for itself but for god henceforth this child first belongs not to me not even to itself but to god yeah i may be the parent of the child i may have given birth but only because god gave the child i gave birth so actually the child belongs to god and so i'm going to give it back to god to be used for god's purposes let this child fulfill god's plan let this child live for god alone that's the meaning this house i may have built it i may have purchased it it may belong to me but without god's grace i would be nothing but god has helped me to build this house and so i dedicate this house even though i'm going to live here i'm going to live and use it for god's purposes alone that's what it means a house dedication see when it is done with any kind of meaning it has some kind of power some kind of power i i've seen this sometimes when um, you know some sometimes there will be kids who are you know grow up you know they seem to be walking as believers but then uh, they go off wander off you may think of it as backsliding or whatever right wander off they seem to have wandered off from the faith and sometimes these mothers have great confidence they'll say you know yeah he's wandered off but, but i have dedicated him he'll come back right 
in tamil they will say oppu kodutha na vandruva they have such confidence in the fact that they have dedicated their child so that no matter how far he goes he will come back because they dedicated him when he was a baby my mother used to tell me when i was a child you know we have dedicated you to the ministry you have to do ministry only i used to get irritated when i heard that i can't do what i want to do you have to do this only i have dedicated oh you know she never asked me they never asked me right so i try to avoid ministry and kind of go on a different path but then guess what happened he came back right back it's not like i was forced but am i going to say that dedication had nothing to do with it no i think that dedication had real power even an imperfect yet meaningful dedication of a human being has such power what we're talking about is when the bible says we've been made holy it means that god has cut off in some real way that old connection and dedicated us to himself here is a dedication not we are dedicating to god i'm not talking about that i'm saying god in the moment of your salvation yeah i know you didn't ask for it in the moment of your salvation he didn't ask you for it either in the moment of your salvation he said he dedicated you to himself and he said henceforth you will live for me that's the meaning <laughs> i don't know if you can accept it i tell you that has power if you're a true believer if you have really been saved no matter how far you go this has enough power to pull you back what not your will not your dedication i'm talking about god's dedication of you god sanctified you we have been sanctified in the name of jesus christ by the spirit of god the holy spirit did this where is the power to live a holy life with what assurance can we say we'll keep going on the right path just because we you know we'll be you know we'll make sure to do everything right and we'll keep our priorities straight no my friend there's a deeper assurance there's a deeper there's a deeper basis a deeper foundation the foundation is not though no, you know i am surrendering myself every day yes i ought to but the foundation for that surrender is he surrendered me or dedicated me <laughs> only reason you keep surrendering yourself is because he dedicated you <laughs> without that uh, we can stand upside down and we still can't actually live holy and please him see it has real power it has real power god tells jeremiah in jeremiah 1:5 right he says before you were born i sanctified you i appointed you a prophet to the nations so here he is he is is setting apart this jeremiah yet to be born and he says you will be a prophet to the nations right i'm not talking about your specific calling in life we are talking about a dedication to holiness <laughs> dedication to serve god for the rest of your life ephesians 1:4 ephesians 1:4 right just as jeremiah was dedicated even before he was born God did something that was in many ways everything flowed from that made him a prophet Ephesians 1 says that God did something before the foundation of the world look at that he chose us in him verse 4 he chose us in him God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him before you were ever born before the world was created before the foundation of the world god thought about you and he chose you for what to be holy and blameless before him now think about that are you telling me that has no power are you telling me that has no effect see that's what we're talking about before the foundation of the world he did this but in the moment of the of your salvation he kind of formalized it <laughs> sanctified you right he sanctified you everybody say god sanctified me right god consecrated me right 
He set me apart for himself. He separated, you know, this is, see, this has really happened. This is not just a nice imagination, you know, you imagine yourself to be sanctified, you know, separated from the old world and the flesh and the sin and uh, just imagine yourself to be dedicated. No, this is, the, the Bible presents this as real truth. Yeah, you can't see it with your eyes. It didn't happen in an outward, uh, external manner. It happened in an internal manner. It happened inside of you. It happened in your heart. Like what we were talking about last week, regeneration born again, what happens is in your heart there is a deep change, there is a radical change. New heart, a new spirit. Last week what we spoke and this week you have to take it together to get the full picture. Right? It all happens at the moment of your salvation. Last week and this week is about how God goes deep inside you and changes your very nature. Your very nature. Right? Your very nature. It happens very deep inside of you, my friend. You are separated on the inside. You're separated. God cut off. I'm not saying you cut off. I'm saying God cut off your old association with the world, with the flesh, with sin, with your lusts. And God established a new connection by dedicating you unto himself. Look at Hebrews 9 verse 13. I want to show you that this change happened deep inside of you, right? The spiritual change happened deep inside of you. This determined, de determinative change, this determines everything else. Without this, I say, you can stand upside down, you can try all you want, you can never actually live a holy life pleasing to God. With this, real change is possible. Real growth is possible. Hebrews 9, 13 to 14. For if the blood of go goats and bulls, he's going to compare the Old Testament power of the blood sprinkling versus the New Testament power of Jesus' blood sprinkled upon our hearts. Listen, Hebrews 9.13. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh. He's saying, if in the Old Testament these animals' blood are able to give some kind of external purification of the flesh, right? External sanctification. How much more? Verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ? We're talking about the blood of Christ, not the blood of an animal. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 14. You have to look at it carefully. How much more will the blood of Christ do what? Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The blood of Christ purifies our conscience. Now immediately when we say conscience, we may be tempted to think the blood of Christ purifies my guilty conscience. My conscience is guilty because of my past sin and the blood of Christ purifies that. Yes, it purifies that, but this verse is not talking about that. Look at the verse carefully. He does not say it purifies our conscience from our guilt so that we are no longer feeling guilty and we're feeling peaceful and good. No, it does not say that. It says he purifies our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. What he means is he purifies our conscience from doing dead works in the future. He purifies our conscience in such a way that we are enabled not to do dead works in the future, but rather to serve the living God. He's thinking about the conscience, not with a backward focus, but with a, few, with a forward orientation. Meaning, sometimes we think conscience means only backward, right? I did something wrong, I'm feeling guilty in my conscience. Backward, right? But conscience also has forward-looking orientation. Meaning, sometimes can't do something wrong. Have you ever had that experience, right? You feel like you can't do it because your conscience won't allow it, right? Maybe some others want you to do something and you tell them, no, I, I can't do that. My conscience simply won't allow me to do it. So your conscience not only, you know, makes you feel guilty when you go wrong, but sometimes it keeps you from going wrong. It pulls you back from 
going wrong. It does not permit certain things. Paul, uh, uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking about that. He's saying basically the conscience as the part of the heart which has a controlling effect on our future actions, on our future life. He's saying God through the blood of Christ in salvation, what he does is God sprinkles the blood of Christ in your heart in such a manner that that part of your heart, your conscience, which has a controlling effect on your future actions is changed in such a drastic way that it will no longer allow you to do dead works. It'll say, no, I can't allow that. And it will make you to serve the living God. Right? It'll make you to do good works. Your conscience, which previously justified these dead works, these sinful works, the conscience, which previously said, yeah, go ahead and do it. It's okay. The gain you get from it is better than what you lose. Your conscience, which said, you know, anyway, you're not as bad as that person. Your conscience, which said all this is now saying, no, 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 we can't do that. You can't do that. You know, you got to please God. You got to live for God. Event in there affected a deep change in your conscience. See, your conscience separated, dedicated unto God. It's basically the same thing like last week, just in a different you know, way, right? There's a deep change in your heart, right? You're separated, dedicated unto God forever. It's a done deal. It's finished. It's done by God. What did you have to do with it? Not much. What does a baby have to do with its own dedication? Not much. In salvation, we believe. That's all we do. But believing is nothing we can take credit for. It's just like opening your hand and receiving the glorious gift. Right? We can't say, I believed. No, you just received this glorious gift. Right? You were smart enough to do that. <laughs> and even that, God helped you believe. The Bible says, by grace have you been saved through faith that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Right? Something glorious, something miraculous happens in salvation. You hear the word being preached, the word of the gospel, and you respond. The Holy Spirit helps you to respond. And you just make a simple act of faith. You just believe in Jesus. You just say, he's Lord. You confess him. In that moment, the Holy Spirit goes in there. He does a radical rehaul, overhaul in your heart. New heart, new spirit, new conscience, which will no longer excuse you, but pull you back. <laughs> right? Have you had this deep change happen inside of you, my friend? This is what it means to be already sanctified. It means more, actually. But I'm going to stop there because I can't do justice to what the other thing that I wanted to show, right? It means a lot more. I'm just scratching the surface. What the point is, God has gone inside you and, and done something major, radical, deep, right? Last week, we said he, he's kind of inclined your heart towards him. A heart that was inclined towards sin and the world and the lust and the flesh is now inclined towards God. And this week, we're saying this conscience, this heart that was previously attached with the world, with the flesh, with the sin and with all, you know, pleasing ourselves, this heart has been separated so that you in your heart no longer belong to the ways of this world, to the ways of sin. You just don't belong. It's not, we're not saying, you know, just think of yourself as you don't belong. No, actually, you don't belong. That's what happens in salvation. God kind of turns you upside down inside so that you just can't be at home with sin anymore. <laughs> right? It just makes your life miserable. The most miserable person, one preacher said, is a believer living in sin. Because an unbeliever sinning is very happy. He's enjoying it. A believer living for God is very happy. But sometimes a believer is sinning. And that believer is the most miserable person if he's a true believer. Because you'll see that person has no peace, no joy, can't read the Bible, can't pray, can't, doesn't even want to get out of the room, has his head hung low, you know, just, just cries and, you know, just regrets and just thinks, you know, how could I have done this against God? You know, how, you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> have you had that experience? You see, no believer is perfect. 
No believer can claim to be perfect. If somebody claims to be perfect in their living and conduct, don't believe them. That's what Apostle John says. Every believer needs to continually repent of their sin and ask for forgiveness and cleansing and all that is there, you see. So, but at the same time, the same John says, a, a believer cannot keep on sinning because God's seed abides in him. His conscience won't allow it. See, It's not whether you're sinning or not. That's not the question. Has your attitude towards sin changed? Has your attitude toward the world changed? Do you feel at home with the world and with the sin and with the flesh and with all that like before? Or do you feel like I'm not at home? My home seems to be somewhere else. I'm happy when I serve God, when I live for God. That is what gives me the greatest satisfaction and joy. Has there been this real change in your heart? I see. That is what real salvation is all about. If there is no real change deep inside the heart, if, if there is no fundamental reorienting towards in, in their attitude towards sin and things like that, that means real salvation is not there. Real salvation is not just, you know, you come, you know, you decide to follow Jesus and then you try your best. No, when you take Jesus, I, you know, actually what happens is Jesus, you know, the, Jesus said, unless the Father draws me, you draws you, you cannot even come to me. Real salvation is the Father drawing you to Jesus and the Holy Spirit helping you to believe in Him and the Holy Spirit producing a miracle in your heart. Yeah, everything in your outward life may not change, but something deep has changed in your heart which will begin to show something on the outside. Make itself evident. If you're a believer who has experienced real change, rejoice in it, you are saved. Nothing can reverse this. It's done, deal, finished, over. You're sanctified forever perfected yeah you will continuously grow in holiness in practical holy living you will continuously grow and one day not in this life but when jesus returns you will be made actually perfect in conduct and character and nature and everything right absolute perfection we're talking about but that's not in this life that's another error so many errors start in sanctification right but what i'm saying is if you've not received this deep change and you want to change, my friend, you can stand upside down, but you can't change. The way to change is you need Jesus. The way to change is you need Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. You need to say, Jesus, I need you. you know, I need you to go in and change me. I need you to save me. I need you to change me. Let's all stand up and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for effecting a deep, substantial change inside of us, O oh Lord. You have sanctified us. You have set apart us for yourself to live for you. And that has real power and that can really enable us to live holy lives, O oh Lord, pleasing you, doing your will, serving you, O oh God. I pray that you will help us to serve you I pray that you'll help us to dedicate ourselves because you have dedicated us. Surrender ourselves more and more. Experience this life-changing power more and more in our practical day-to-day -day lives as we overcome sin and its temptations and serve you. Do your will. Fulfill your will. Help us to be more and more like Jesus, O oh Lord. Setting us, ourselves apart for your purposes, for your glory, for your kingdom. Help us not to live for ourselves or even for anything in the world, but help us to live for you, O oh Lord. We thank you. We pray that you will lead us and we'll help us to realize what a great thing you have done by saving us. We are not the old person. We are a new person on the inside. Pray that you'll continue to bless your people, continue to lead them, guide them, protect them from every harm and danger, spiritual, mental, emotional, spiritual, physical, every harm and danger. We pray you will protect them, guard them, keep them safe. Continue to fulfill your purposes in their lives. We commit them to your mighty hands. We bless them in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit 
Abide with us all for now and forevermore. Amen.